Hi, I'm Katie and today I will be teaching you how to finish an ornament in this style with beaded edges using my finish of Blackbird Designs Snow Garden as the example. I have already started as you can see, but I will detail the entire process from start to finish. So the first thing to do is you need to back stitch all around the edge of your pattern. This will become the line at which you turn and then you use these stitches to whip front and back together and to attach the little decorative beads on your finish. This stitched example here is old. This is a partial stitch of Little House Needleworks potted poinsettia. As you can see, I just did the poinsettia and I changed the colors around a little bit. So, snow garden though. Every chart has a stopping point. As you can see, I obviously can't show you the chart here, but often the point where the chart ends can be a good exterior line. That's exactly what I used here for my poinsettia ornament. And that's where I have started the back stitch lines that will form the edge of this ornament on Snow Garden. So I used the edge of my chart to plot my line. It is two rows above the outermost stitches and I have just gone, started stitching around. You need to do the entire exterior. I've gone over four threads because I think that looks proportional, but this is really a matter of personal taste. You can do over two, over four, over six, over eight, whatever appeals to you. Longer stitches will mean for wider wraps. So again, if this is your first time doing it, you can follow me exactly or you can experiment a little bit. And your corners may not always meet up exactly here uh, where my line ended. I had a four and four, but at the top, this was actually six rows from where the top back stitch line needs to start. I thought that over six looked better than over four and over two, so I took a long stitch, back stitch over six threads. And then on this side, I'm going to have to be very careful to mirror that exactly so that everything lines up. Also, your choice of back stitching thread is another decision you have to make. I am going to be using four millimeter crystal rounds as my decorative beads here. So I chose a white thread that coordinated with the whitest white used on my stitch. This was Swa 103, which I could have used to coordinate, but I think this technique looks best with a slightly thicker thread for your back stitching and wrapping. So instead, I've used Swa Dalger FO2, which is a reasonably good color match. It's a little thicker, and I think it works well. You can also use something contrasting. As you can see here, I used a gold metallic that went with the beads, picked up some of the highlights in my stitch, but ultimately was a contrast to the stitch and the threads. So after you've selected your beads and your back stitching thread, you need to back stitch all the way around your ornament. So I'm going over four threads here, and I'm trying not to stick my head in the frame this time, so this will be pretty slow. The other thing I would like to note is that you will be picking up each of these stitches and using a wrap stitch to adhere front and back together and to attach the beads. So your back stitches need to be very secure. I have used triple tied knots to tie all my thread ends together. Whatever your preferred method is, whatever works for you is fine. However, you just need to make sure that your stitches are very secure because you will be pulling on them. Not anything crazy if you're doing it right, but they need to be fully secured ends 
on all of your back stitches. So, because this is kind of hard to do on camera and I have absolutely no idea how to do that fast forward thing in video editing, I'm going to continue back stitching all the way around Snow Garden and then come back to you when I've finished. I now have a finished backstitch outline that goes all the way around Snow Garden with um, the over six mirrored at the top on both sides here so that everything lines up next. Lines up nicely, sorry. And then my next step will be to create the back for this piece. So in this ornament style, you sandwich front and back together, you lace them up and you accent with, accent with beads. So the front and the back need to mirror each other exactly so that your back stitches line up on all sides and then you can just whip them together quite easily. Now you could use a contrasting linen if you've got one of the exact same count that you're certain is the same size or you could even use a contrasting fabric for your back, although you'd have to then exactly mark the points for your back stitches to make sure that everything lines up. I find it, as you can see both here and on this ornament, much easier to just use the same linen I used for the front, but that is one thing you can do to jazz up your finish a little bit. However, I'm gonna be lazy today and use the same linen that I did for my stitch of Snow Garden since as you can see I've got quite a lot of it. This is 38 count Brewer's Malt, Brewer's Malt and my next step will be to cut another square of it the same size and then do an exact mirrored back stitch outline to match the front. I now have two pieces, front and back, with exactly matching backstitch outlines. I really recommend that while you're stitching and at the end that you lightly finger press and then line these two up to make sure that they match on all sides just because this is the point at which you'll be able to correct your work if you don't. So just check that your back stitch just line up and that you've got two rectangles that are perfectly mirrored and will line up together nicely. These do, so I'm okay to proceed to the next step. If you wanted to use feasible web to back your stitching, now would be the point to put it in. I don't really think I need it on this, so I'm just going to skip that and instead I'm going to put in my seam allowances and cut this down. I am going to use a half inch. So I've got my ruler and a ceramic pencil, which is my preferred tool for marking fabric. This one is by Dritz, but I think they have been discontinued. So I have bought a Bohen one and that will be the next one I try when I'm through the lead on this. So I'm just going to go ahead and mark a half inch outline on all sides, front and back here. I've now marked my seam allowance cut lines on both front, as front and back, as well as an extra additional mark here on the top of each to remind me that this way goes up because I've got my over six stitch at the top corners of each of these rectangles and I want them to line up when I'm lacing. So that's just to remind myself. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut all of these out along my cut line for the seam allowance. These have now been cut down and the next step is to trim the corners. I don't like to trim too close just because linen does ravel, but you do need to remove some of the bulk here, so I will leave it to your discretion how much you want to trim out. That's about as much as I've got there. You'll want less if you like really sharp corners, or you can of course also use fray check or tacky glue 
on the edges here to make sure that they don't ravel. Please note those are non-archival and they will degrade your fabric over time. The other thing I'm going to mention is that I used a half inch seam allowance just because that's what I'm used to. There's no special reason to use it. Just, you know, if you usually work with three eighths or if you work with more, you know, use whatever your preferred seam allowance is. There's absolutely no reason why you have to use half an inch other than that's what I usually use. These are cut down and the next step is to make your shapes. The first step will be to finger press all of this and that starts in the corner. So I'm going to finger press this into a rectangle starting with the corners and then once I have finger pressed the shape here, I'm getting the corners right at that point where the threads meet. And once I've finger pressed my rectangle, then I'll take this to my iron and actually press it to get a nice sharp outline. So having pressed in my four corners, now I've turned to the sides and I'm just rolling it under at the back stitch line. You'll find that that acts as a really good guideline and that it's quite easy to fold at that. So I'm going to repeat this front and back and finger press both rectangles. Front and back have now both been finger pressed and I'm going to take these to the iron and then properly press them for a good sharp fold. Front and back have now been carefully pressed and I'm ready to begin assembly. The first step in which is to decide how to fill the ornament. For this ornament, which as you can see has kind of a soft unformed shape, very, which is nice for a smaller ornament, I used a thicker but not particularly dense felt, which I will link in the description along with all materials used today. And just the felt without anything to give it more shape than that. I think feeling this, this is two layers of thicker felt. However, this ornament is a little bit larger, a little more structured, so I'd like a flatter and more defined feel for that. So to achieve that, I am going to just very lightly pad this out with a one millimeter thick merino wool felt and a little bit of Bristol paper to stiffen it and to give it a little more shape. This is the same 100, lib, 100 pound, 100 lib, 100 pound weight Bristol that is used in making patterns for Simple Harmony. I use it a lot for finishing in addition to pattern making. So I am going to measure and then cut a piece of Bristol that is a little smaller than my rectangle here. So I'm gonna mark that out at, it would help if I had lead in this thing. So this is just over four and a half inches tall, so I'm going to put that a little bit short of four and a half inches, maybe like four and three eighths. So I've marked a rectangle and then I'm going to cut it out. I've cut my rectangle and now I'm checking it for size. I actually think that this is just a little bit large and I am going to cut it down. You want it to stop a little more short of that because if it comes too close to the edge, it will actually make it more difficult to lace up your two pieces. So you want it to be big enough to give your ornament structure. If you're using vellum bristol, you can just use a simple unreinforced felt lining for your ornament. But if you're using the stiffer bristol, you want it to stop, yeah, that's about right. So that you can easily maneuver your needle. You will see this in action later in the tutorial. The next step will be to lightly pad this. I could just put the bristol 
in between the two pieces, but I would like just a little bit of padding for a softer look. So I'm going to cut down a square of felt that's just a little bit smaller than my Bristol here. I have now cut my felt piece, which is just a touch smaller than my Bristol, and I am going to glue it down with just a little tacky glue using a toothpick. You don't have to use too much, just enough to make sure that it adheres and it doesn't slip while you are assembling the ornament, she says as she takes a gigantic glob on her toothpick, but it will be pretty light once it's spread out. I'm just going to pad the front side of the ornament because I don't want too much padding here. I would like this to have an overall flatter look, but you can use the same principle with as much padding as you want or don't want on your ornament. You can use thinner felt, you can use thicker felt, you can do front only, you can do front and back, or you can skip the bristle and just do felt. So I have now padded out my lining piece for the ornament. I am going to let this dry under weights. As you can see, it's already curving from the tacky glue. So I'm going to press that out, let it dry a little bit, and then come back to you for the assembly. Okay, so I've let my filler piece dry of felt and Bristol paper and I'm getting ready for assembly. The first thing will be to put in the hanger for my ornament, and so you'll have to decide what you want to use and what purpose does it serve. For ornaments, I like to use kind of thinner or thicker metallic braids just because I find they survive the tree branches better. Something like a nice silk ribbon is really beautiful, but it tends to get shredded by my tree branches because I use a real tree. However, a chronic braid that's commonly used in needlepoint makes for a great ornament hanger if this is gonna go on a tree. Of course, you can use this finishing style for anything. My mom likes to do Brenda Gervais larger seasonal pieces like Harvest Queen and Bobbing for Pumpkins, you know, those larger rectangular seasonal pieces. And then she finishes them as wall hangings and hangs them up on in her kitchen and rotates them with every season. So, you know, not everything has to be in a frame under glass. You could use well, this method for a different piece that's not an ornament. You just, especially if it's larger, you need to reinforce it with Bristol so that it doesn't bow on you. And then choose beads in a hanger that are appropriate to your desired style. So for this, I am going to use just a plain white chronic braid. This is a number eight braid in color number 100, which is just a plain winter white. So I'm going to cut a long length. And then use a nice fatty tapestry needle. And then put this in at the top. I like to go right in right at the corners. And then I'm going to do a nice fat knot because your ornament will be hanging from this and it needs to survive it. Got a fat double knot there. Pull that through, then rearrange my pressing. And now I have to kind of eyeball how big do I want this to be. I'm gonna say about that. And so I'm going to clip this thread a little bit to give me a better idea of how far I need to pull this through. I'm re-thread the other end. You know, it would help if I could thread my needle here. Okay, re-thread the other end, and then I'm gonna go in at the opposite top corner. Take that through. 
again to a nice big fat double knot and again you should pull it out and check if the length is what you want I'm eyeballing it and I think that that's fine but that's the result of experience so I've made my double knot and clip that end move the needle out of the way and then pull this through get the corners back into place and now I've got a hanger for my ornament at this point I am ready to put these together and start assembling this so I'm gonna lay this face down and put my bristle in right there I'm gonna check this is the top it's meeting the top here and then I will line these up and start lacing. I am going to take in my lacing thread. So I'm gonna start just a little bit below this top corner and I'm gonna come up right through the middle of one of these back stitches. I want that to be inside I fold. I'm ready to start and then to make sure that this little sandwich doesn't get too out of shape you can either pin it in place or the easier option although one that can put a little dent in your fabric is to just use wonder clips I'm gonna be lazy today and use wonder clips so I'm going to line these up at the corners. I'm going to try and make sure that my Bristol paper is roughly centered inside. I'm going to clip my corners just to keep this in place while I'm lacing and make sure that everything is stays lined up. So clipped at four corners and I'm going to clip some of my pins out of the way and then the next thing is to move this hanger out of the way so that it's not catching on your lacing thread and so I'm just going to take a little safety pin and I'm going to pin this down out of the way on the back so that it's not catching on my long lacing thread here. I do like to use very long lengths of thread when I'm stitching, when I'm lacing, when I'm doing anything. This is a personal quirk that I do not recommend. It does not generally make for good stitching. I'm actually going to have to move this clip just a little bit so I can start here. I've got these, yep, lined up. And I'm starting at this second back stitch below the corner and I'm just going to go through it parallel and then insert my needle diagonally to come up at the next back stitch. Pull my thread through. It'll, it'll be a little loose at first and then as you continue pulling it'll tighten up over time. So don't worry too much about that. And now I have to decide how I'm going to add the beads. So I've done two stitches, two lacing stitches through the back stitches, and now I am going to add on one of my crystal beads and see how that looks. These are much larger than the beads I used on this finish. So I'm just kind of guessing here what I want to do. I think that looks nice. So I think my order is going to be two lacing stitches between each bead. So I'm going to continue lacing through the opposing stitch, coming diagonally up through the next back stitch. So your lacing stitches 
are parallel here. Just continuing to pull this tight. One lacing stitch. So you want to make sure that you pick up just your back stitch and not the, th the fabric underneath. So I've done two lacing stitches and by my previously determined pattern, this would be where I would add my next bead, but I think that's going to look a little too cluttered. So I'm actually gonna take a third stitch and then see if I wanna go three or four stitches, lacing stitches between beads. So I'm taking a fourth lacing stitch, coming up through the next back stitch Pull the thread through, hold it on the side, see how does that look. And now I think I'm ready to add another bead. So my order is actually going to be bead, three lacing stitches, bead, three lacing stitches. That looks good. Since these beads are a little larger, I'm leaving more space between them for a smaller bead like this one. I think my order was every other stitch, but you should really just do what feels right to you. This with the larger four millimeter rounds could also be four stitches or five stitches between beads. It really depends how much decoration you want on your exterior and how you want it spaced. So I've added on my second bead and then I'm gonna go ahead and continue taking my lacing stitches. It would help if I could actually, you know, get my needle under the back stitches. And that's, yeah. One. Actually, I think my thread has gone over my bead. Yeah, it did. So, yeah, try and make sure your lacing thread isn't catching on your beads there. That is better. Sorry, I hope you could actually see that. I'm still getting used to the camera setup on tutorials. And then adjust your fabric as necessary while you're lacing to try and keep your back stitches lining up. Depending on how you're pulling your thread as you lace, it can kind of warp a little bit. That's why you have your clips in at the corners to make sure that everything stays in place and that it doesn't skew too much as you're lacing. So here I haven't done a very good job of pressing right at the fold. My back stitches on this side are facing slightly downward and I'm finding them a little hard to pick up. And I've done three lacing stitches and now I'm going to add another bead and then I will repeat this process around the next three sides and come back. So I've worked mostly around three sides and I am coming up on this top corner and I wanted to show you how I do this to get a good corner. So I'm going parallel. So my lacing stitches, I realized it was kind of hard to see this on my previous part of the tutorial. So. My lacing stitches are like this, and then you have the thread coming across straight. You take your needle through, and then your needle goes diagonally to the next stitch, which in this case is the first stitch on the top, and which I'm really having trouble picking up here. Okay. So your thread goes parallel and then your needle goes diagonal to pick up your next back stitch and lace them together. Now to get a good corner, I can remove my wonder clip and I'm also going to have to take care to navigate around my thread hanger here. I like to lace together the entire corner first and then 
go back and add in the bead if I do need a bead at this point, which it turns out I do. I want one right there. I want one right there. Sorry, I'm still having issues trying to get everything in the right <laughs> camera location. So I've laced here and here right around this corner. And then I am going to go back to this last back stitch, which is where I want to put my bead. I'm going to thread on a bead. Get my window clip. And then I am going to take it through the opposite back stitch and then bring my thread up. Sorry, bring my needle up again through the next back stitch as if this were my first time lacing. So I'm essentially going over the corner twice to add on the bead. And then I am going to start lacing up this top side. I've already done the first stitch, so I'm just gonna go over it again, going into the parallel stitch, and then bringing my needle up under the next back stitch. So again, angling your needle diagonally to get that back stitch. Pulling it through and now I've got the hanger. I don't want to keep going over this so I'm going to just pull through so that the hanger is um, not caught up by my lacing. So even though it's roughly secured on the back, just make sure you're watching for it as you're on this top side so that you're not inadvertently lacing it down. So I've taken one lacing stitch since my last bead. I'm gonna just kind of hold that hanger down with my finger. And then I'm going to take my needle in to the opposing back stitch, then pick up the next back stitch. This will be lacing stitch number two taking care to keep my thread clear of the beads. It does kind of like to catch on them. Taking lacing stitch number three, again, parallel and then diagonal to get the last stitch. I am making sure to just pick up the back stitches here and not the fabric. I know this is a little hard to see because of all the tone on tone stitching, but hopefully the description makes it clear enough. And then I'm going to throw out on a bead since I've done three lacing stitches and it's ready for time for another bead. I'm gonna go parallel and then bring it up diagonally to the next back stitch and pull my thread through. I'm now going to work all the way across the top, do the corner here as I did before, and then come back to you right at the end to show how I finish this ornament off. So I've gone around the last corner, making sure to go over my corner stitches twice. I whipped those together and then I went back and then threaded on my bead and I'm now at my very last lacing stitch on this or on this ornament. I was also again careful to keep the hanger free as I laced so that this coat is coming out straight at this corner and wasn't inadvertently caught up in my lacing thread. So I've got my last back stitches to lace together. I'm going to do and then I'm going to come up at my starting point and now the last thing to do here is to end my thread which I'm going to do by taking it trying to take it into the linen running it under the linen along my back stitches coming up here at my back stitches. Pull this through again, making sure that I don't catch any of my beads with the lacing thread. There. And then I'm going to put this in again over just one 
thread of the linen and then run it along, come up again. Now, this is how I like to end my thread, but any way that you know that will just make sure that these are secure works just fine. You just need to make sure that when you end your thread, you've really secured it because any pulling on these beads, which can happen, they can catch on things, especially an ornament on a tree. They need to be able to sustain light pulling or distortion of the beads without pulling your lacing thread loose. So again, I'm picking up one thread of the linen and then I'm just coming back the way that I came. thread coming up and oh I have caught my beads so again just gonna release that carefully pull it through and now I'm satisfied that this is secure so I'm going to release the hanger by unpinning the safety pin And then I am going to clip my thread end, making sure that I don't catch my lacing thread or my hanger in the process. And just use my needle to kind of push that down so that you don't see that clipped end. And now I have a finished ornament. The last thing I am going to do is I'm just going to manipulate this flat a little bit. The Bristol paper has some flex in it, so it can get distorted with handling. So just, you know, flatten it as necessary if, that, if you are using the Bristol paper and if that has happened to you in finishing. That concludes the tutorial for this style of ornament finishing, which I hope you liked and that you find helpful. Simple Harmony tutorials will resume next week. And until then, happy stitching.